Welcome to the No Name Brand Podcast. My name is Sashka Hanarapal, actress, singer, dancer, turned brand marketing sales and advertising strategist who brands your soul. And each week I bring you an inspiring person or message to help you discover your undergod. Turn up your leadership notches, challenge the status quo, because you're fast and furious with a powerful message to share with the world. Thank you for taking time out with me today. And without further ado, let's get our creative and wisdom juices for low wall. Oh gosh, folks, today is going to be one hell of a treat. I have a guest on the show that I personally perceive is the Guyanese Maya Angelo, wisdom pure. Now, our next guest knew at six years old already that she was going to speak wisdom and empowerment to the world. Standing on her grandmother's steps, she would debate and encourage her cousins to try new things at six years old. Now, for those of us who are parents and grandparents, when we listen to our six-year-olds, we think, oh, that's so cute. But when they have such authority and influence at that age, you know something big is brewing. Now, our guest is highly respected in the ethnic community in Britain, with dedicated followers too. And as you all know, because I preach this often enough, the reason we follow someone is because we believe that that person holds the key, which we believe not to have within ourselves. And our next guest certainly has it. Having interviewed icons such as Dr. Maya Angelou, Nelson Mandela, Madiba, Ian La Vincent, Barry White, Be Still My Heart, Luther Vandross, Whitney Houston, Rest Her Soul, Terry McMillan, John Holt, and more. I mean, come on. I today have the honor of sharing this exceptional woman with you today. Now, she not only served as the chief editor of the magazine's Pride and she Caribbean, but also had two radio shows on Choice FM, co-hosting Ladies Room and after her own namesake, a radio show. Now, what makes this change agent so special to be able to interview all these power icons and influence generations? She challenges the status quo. Yes, please. She tackles hard issues that often don't want to be spoken about in communities such as rape, sexism, incest, domestic violence. She's incredibly passionate about empowering you and the youth to be confident, assertive, and headstrong in your decisions to want to be the best version of you. I would like some more of that, please, in the world. Now, today, I'm super honored to bring to you our modern-day Cinderella that relied on many as a community to help her get where she is today, but never take for granted what she has achieved and is achieving. Let's all please welcome the one and only Sherry Ann Dixon. Hello, Sherry Ann. <laughs> hello, hello. How wonderful. And you were speaking, I was thinking, is that me? I've forgotten <laughs> I've done half those things. My goodness. No, 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 no. Don't forget those things. It's incredible the amount of things that you've been doing. I mean, I want to kick things off. I first would love to ask you, what makes you happy today with all these things that you've been recognized for, that you've put into action, that you've empowered people around you? and help them be assertive? And how did your state of happy change from then, say your 20s, to the success and the place that you are in now? Good question. Actually, the first time I've ever been asked that one. (laughs) I know my 20-something-year-old self was busy trying to get things. Although I was doing what I wanted to do, like getting through the door, making up a certain person, and feeling happy about that. I think it was about things as well, because at 20 odd, I had my home and my children. There were tick boxes of things that one should achieve by a certain age. Now, sitting here as a 64 going towards 65, I've forgotten now, 64 going 65, it's not things that are important. It's more the feeling of when somebody sends me a text or an email For example, I got one, I would say, earlier this year where a woman said, you were teaching a class, you might not remember me, but you were teaching a class, and you kept calling me the quiet one, the quiet one. But what I do remember is you'd come in past and occasionally you'd put your hand just on my shoulder to sort of 
let me know that you recognized that I was there. And if she wanted to make a move to ask me more questions, that she could. And she said, little did you know that I was in that class because my child had been raped. And they sent me, because I had a breakdown, and they sent me to find my confidence and to regain some sense of normality in my life. And in two and a half days, that's what you did, Sherry Ann Dixon. Now I have affirmations on my wall, me and my daughter working on our self-esteem because we both lost it. It wasn't just my daughter. And I'm looking out my window as I type this letter and I'm watching her play in the garden downstairs in a new area that I'm in. And I think about you every time I hear her say, I am somebody, I can do this, I can do this. And, you know, all the things that I taught them to do. So for me, in answer to that, it's the feeling that you get when somebody shares back with you the things that you've injected in them to make them a better person. I cannot even begin to imagine any of those topics. I'm aware of them. I've seen it, people around me with rape and incest and sexism, domestic violence. When you speak to these women, women in general, how are you approaching the topics? Because a lot of younger folk, myself included, well, I'm not a coach or whatever, they'll come in and they go straight to the point, almost making you feel like the victim (laughs) rather than a survivor. How are you empowering the warrior, the conqueror, the phoenix, as opposed to the victim? Yeah, that's the hardest one because quite often, this is the thing people need to understand, things happen along the way, whether it's a child being abused or some woman being abused, and sometimes men going through stuff that they never tell you about. And the problem doesn't surface because they get through the moment, don't they? Get through, I'm not going to let this bother me. And they get through and they become maybe a Lord Mayor or somewhere. And then one day, it could be that they're in, in an office and somebody says something, that joke, that something that tips them over the edge and they melt. When they speak to me, it's for me to allow them to cry because I'm not a social worker or I don't do that sort of thing. But to have another adult at the other end that say, it tells you, it's okay to cry, you know. It's mm. okay. I like crying. I like crying too and make a joke of it so that you allow them to feel at ease, to express themselves, to be at peace with themselves, to say, when my dad hit me in my head when I was only five years old, I was angry, but I didn't get the opportunity to tell him I'm angry and allow him to speak to me and tell me those things, this Lord Mayor, to tell me those things. And so he doesn't always have to go and tell his dad in that manner. He could write it down. He could speak to me and express the anger of how he felt that day. And then he lets it out. He lets it out. And then he's free from the anger. That's what I know. Mm -hmm. That's the answer I have for you. That's the feeling that I love. I mean, obviously, I, I wouldn't be in a situation where I put myself in danger. But what people need to understand, there's a lot of us that are carrying baggage, stuff, I didn't speak to my dad. My dad was a kind man. He was a nice man. But he was brought up in the 60s, 50s, where they were allowed to be rude to Mm. people. Can you get through that door? (laughs) Meaning you're putting on weight, right? Mm. (laughs) And I can laugh about it now, but when you're 40-something and you're struggling with that, going towards 50, hating the world, not sure if you've done enough, you know all the things we put ourselves through, particularly women. I remember him being quite blasé about what he said, and I was just going into locks as well. And he kept on saying, I didn't send her to England for her to go and put on locks. And I'm like, what is wrong with locks? Because it's still tarnished. And there was this black man that wasn't adhering to some of the things that were black. Do you see what I mean? So I struggled and I had to have this conversation. Part of the book that I'm writing says conversations, the conversations you have to have. Because sometimes you have to tell them when they're alive, I love you. I really love you. You are my heart. But there's a certain part of you that keep on insulting me or doing whatever it is that's insulting me. And I don't understand why you do that. Why would you want to hurt me? Sometimes you have to have that conversation because they don't even know they're doing it. That's so true because you only do what you talked. Like you don't know what to become unless you know what to become. 
And exactly. she exposed to something what to become. So if you've only seen bad or the other side of good, that's all you know, whether it's yeah. been education or religion. You love speaking to children. From the inside out, what does it give you to start with the children as opposed to the parents or the adults? What are they seeking? It's a whole different language and body language and identity that they're wanting to find within themselves that they're seeing within you where they're going, she's got it, she's got it. I remember, I'm going to give you two incidents. Incidences. Oh God, anybody think I've been drinking? It's just the heat in London. (laughs) I went to Wales and I was doing this whole South Wales thing on black history. And I was like, why would they want to know this? Because they had all the questions. I was going from school to school. And it was really funny to look at their little faces when they wanted to know a little more about black people and how they came. So I had to transform my whole body language and my all the words. And I was thinking, how am I going to get this over to them? Why we should celebrate black history, for example. So I had to, okay, I said, beyond, I got to get some figures, some young figures that they would know. And it was so funny because I went for some of the people, they didn't even know them. This is how the world changes so fast. And so I had to delve in and I had to get more fire. But then I had to go, how I did it is I got more fire. And then I got the person who was older than him back in the 50s who started this whole thing. So show them then and then show them now, or in fact, show them now and then go back to then. Muhammad Ali, Mm -hmm. they didn't even know who he was. What? Uh, No, they didn't. This is really funny. And so I had to go back. I had to come into the here and now. They didn't know Lennox Lewis, though. And then they knew something. It's so funny how things change. And Queen Latifah, my children would know, for my children in their 30s, They didn't know, so I had to find somebody else. And it's really funny how you can't be appalled and you can't be like, what? You don't know that? You have to say, okay, well, name me a runner. Name me somebody that you really like that does music. Tell me who. And then they go, (laughs) Jay-Z. Hey, <laughs> Beyonce. Uh, Beyonce. And, uh, and then they come up with all these names and uh, oh yeah, um, Sierra, Sierra. And then they talk about, and so basically it's coming down to their mindset and not just teaching them. It's like interaction. And I love the interaction because, and maybe that's what I had with my grandmother and grandfather because I grew up in their house. My mom was only 18 or 16, sorry, when she conceived me. And my grand, so it was like, you know, her child having a child. So I grew up with my grandparents because my mother had carried on having children. So I grew up with them and we were always reading. And whenever we read um, Emily Blyton, Billy Bunter and these comics, she would translate into grown-up terms and childish terms. So I would then retranslate it as a six-year or seven-year-old on the stairs. I love telling stories. So I say, every time you see a child doing something, look at what they're doing and try to see if you can take them to the actor's class or take them to a play or help them to play the piano because sometimes what you see is what you're going to get if you can nurture that. If you can, if you can. It's pretty interesting to see whether it's black or white history or Taiwanese or Chinese or whatever, just the history in general and how the younger generation value it on the value scale where they value it, just in terms of working hard, becoming a legend, becoming an icon, what you actually did, you know, in terms of protesting and starting from the bottom, rags to riches. And they really don't see it. The younger generation really don't see the climb, the ladder going they up don't, to there. No, they don't. They don't see the ladder. They don't see, they see, forget the middle, first step, and they see the top step. That maybe that's a good thing. I, I'm not sure. But I know that along the way, you get to the middle step and sometimes you change your mind because that step that you're going up, you realize, I don't want this anymore. I don't like this. I don't want to do this. I was climbing the ladder of being a nurse because my aunt was a nurse. So it's expected back in the 50s, 60s that you would do as you're told. 
So my aunt said, I want you to be a nurse. And I was studying biology and microbiology and science and all those things, the horrible things that you'd have to do with worms that you'd have to cut them in parts and look to see if they were still moving. All those things I went through and I did my A-levels and all the things that you're supposed to do then and then got to a certain stage and then thought, I don't want to do this anymore. I don't actually like science. I don't want to do that and change totally. I always wanted to express myself or speak on somebody's behalf because I think I always realized that there were some good people out there, but they just didn't know how to ask is one of the things I I would like to say. You know, people just don't know to say, can I? They're like, well, I'm not good enough for that. So they don't ask, they don't try. And I was always the one that was dragging them along, saying, come on, let's do this. (laughs) And now deciding not to be this nurse, I then went into first into Nat West Bank in Sloan Square where all the large dars were and then changed into this Afro here, which they didn't like. Oh, that's not for us. That's radical. That's very radical. Yeah. And then they told me to change it and I just wouldn't change. I just said no because I liked it. You know, some things if you don't care, you go back. But they did me a favor by telling me change it or leave and I left and then went to work in PR and it's in PR that I actually realized about the steps, the ladders, if you want to call it, because the better that you got, the, the quicker you went up that ladder. And PR is something that people just don't realize how they're titillated and tantalized to do something because it was, I went in at the time where there was Errol and I think it was Ariel and Purcell were having a fight with each other about who does the best white clothes. And we had to come up with these campaigns. And what was frightening is, well, my cap, my team won. But the thing is, they were both owned by the same company. Oh, wow. And we were being manipulated. Yeah. We were being manipulated, not knowing. I mean, I was young then. I was a teenager. But you're being manipulated to, oh, no, let's get our team together. Let's come up with our old banner. And then basically, they were both owned by each other. That's amazing. So what was driving you? Because you say you're in PR as a teenager, I mean, and you've been told, okay, nursing, and then you've been told, you know, you're the Afro, and it's, it's just like, no, no, what was your drive? What was pushing you towards? Yeah, I'm starting to wonder about that. What was that drive? What was the energy? I think the fact that I got through doors, it, it, I have to put the mindset, the mindset. It was at a time, if you think about it, in the early 70s, where there was still prejudice and there was still... Certain people couldn't get through the door. And because I was trained by my grandmother, I knew how to eat well, the knives and forks, the glasses, and all the things that you're supposed to do. Whatever job I got, I got, I would go in as the secretary and I'd end up being the executive assistant. Because I think the training happens indoors. Yeah. It happens in your house. So that you don't have to learn from them. You're going in there and if your boss is, uh, it's, this sounds really terrible, but I'm going to say it. My boss, I knew my boss needed a wife from home. Um, he, when he was at home, his wife worried about his uh, gray tea and she worried about his sandwiches, what he liked and his, oh. And when he came, oops, are you there? Yeah. Um, okay, I don't know what happened. But when he came to work, he came in and he would want to see his paper mm-hmm. and his tea. There and I did the same thing for him. I think I had the ability to get up the ladder quickly by just giving people what they wanted. Mm. Does that make sense? Yeah. Now the woman of today, or say Sherry, that's just going too far. Making his tea, (laughs) you're just you're just making you're just pleasing somebody, giving them what they what they need, not what they want. Basically, he needed a wife at work. I was the wife by giving him the paper and putting all his files ready for him and the newspaper folded in four and that was it and next thing you know I wasn't just the secretary I was the executive assistant I mean obviously I knew my job and I had to do the work but we were looking after the Lord Mayor of London Ascot Henley the big corporations like Bovis and um, Tarmac and all these different big names so I've been that I was working for the chair the boss who basically was the chairman of partners of course I am the one that's going with him to <laughs> going with him to the meetings and going with him in the limo and getting the dictation in the limo, you know? I I lived a life because I just knew how to play the game. 
So in answer to that, you need to know how to play the game. And then when you leave that job, you come home, you do what you want to do. Yeah, I mean, maybe your drive was all to do with the empowerment and either empowering yourself or those around you just so that yeah. you're all elevated, whichever moment you found yourself, whether it was in the office or in an interview or at Ascot or at the parliament, you just, your drive was empowerment. I mean, and making people feel happy, mm. if you think about it, because in the office, if I came in, I would bring my, from my guard, two daffodils, for example, and put it on the desk and I was always tidying up. And, you know, I suppose, I think for me, it's taking the joy, my joy, my natural inner joy. And I'm not saying it was easy because, you know, I was a married woman at 21 and children at 22 and 23. So it would have been hard, but I think going to work was elevating myself, learning. I always like to learn and share. I think that's what it was. Well, where have you not spoken yet with your message? Where do you still want to visit and spread the word? I want to go to India and almost put that on my tick box. And the funny thing is on New Year's Day, I went to church and there was a guy they called. <laughs> I don't know why I just did it on New Year's Day, but we should go every week. But, you know, Sherry goes on New Year's Day. And while I was in there, there was a guy that was, um, and they call him the prophet. He just sits there, he doesn't speak. And then suddenly this man just got up and started speaking and praying. And then he said, and you will be going to India. And the funny thing is, in my mailbox, there was an invitation from, I think, an all-women's group. And they invited me to come and speak in India in March. But I couldn't go March just gone because I was in doing my Caribbean tour. So I would say India because it's just one of those things, one of the tick boxes. And I definitely want to go back to certain parts of the Caribbean Maybe more so because my family comes from there and this is a soul-searching type of expedition over the next year to go back to the Caribbean and learn things about being Caribbean. Because I grew up here since age of 10, so some things I don't know. I'm really very English. In life, all of us, we all need to make decisions, choices, whatever they are, because there's no right or wrong. It's just a choice that you need to make. And sometimes they're not easy to make. When you're making your decisions, how are you prioritizing? Like, for example, okay, I'm going to India, but it might be clashing with something. How are you choosing between the two things? Aside from priorities, are you keeping to the vision? How are you putting importance of what needs to be done now in order to make a choice? I'm going with my gut. I'm oh, going with my intuitive yes. feeling. This intuition about India has been in my spirit for over, I'd say, maybe three, four years. I've been talking about going to India, going to India. I can go to any part of the world. I can go to Australia. I can go back to South Africa. Mm. I can do anything I want to do because I'm at the age where, where I can. <laughs> um, <laughs> no children in tow. There's no specific job that I have to wait for two, two days holiday. For me, it's spirit. A spirit, mm. intuition, something's telling me I have to go or do something. And I find the enjoyment in researching where I'm going and what I'm going to do. And I know I'm going to go there, but I don't know anybody there. Well, I have an in-law that's there. But really, that's not the reason to go because I just book a hotel and go. The same thing happened with the Caribbean the tour that I just did, I said from last year, I am going to the Caribbean. I'm going to the Caribbean. I'm going to spend six months in the Caribbean. I didn't know anybody in Barbados. Obviously, I have colleagues there and you know, social media people there. But I just said I wanted to spend three months walking the beach and just writing bits of my book there and I booked a flight and I didn't have anywhere to stay. And a girl just happened to be on social media, Instagram, and I saw her and it says something, something Barbados. She says, oh, I'll be there. I'll be there this year. And she said, oh, have you found somewhere to live? And I said, not yet. She said, would you like me to help you? And that's it. She went around and found me the Airbnb, which turned out to be an old house. And, and he walked down the, in Hastings in Barbados. And I would come out of there and walk down the stairs. And I was at the sea. And I spent the first month, just I booked it for three months. And I spent the first month just coming out of my window, coming out of my apartment, walking down the stairs and walking on the sea every morning or sitting on my veranda, which oh. showed you the palm trees and those things. 
but that's that's it so i think some things are intuition as well so Mm. from all the people that you've interviewed and been in the presence of who you know there's maybe a handful or whatever have made the most impact on you in terms of empowerment that which drives you that accelerated your drive for empowerment Dr. Maya Angelou mm. first, and then Nelson Mandela. Ooh. Dr. Maya Angelou it was really funny. It came into the magazine, and um, they said that I think she was promoting a book, and then she was coming. And they said, Would you like to interview her? And the other girls it came into the desk, and they were like, Oh, no, no, no. And, everybody, and when they came to me, I was like, What? <laughs> Did you say talk to my Andrew? Anyway, eventually I was the one that was given. Nobody wanted to. They didn't even care. They didn't even know who she was. What? Yes, that's so it shows, it really shows you. And oh, when I write this on social media, people always the girls that were in my office always talk about it and they say, Remember when this happened? And basically I had to interview her and I was so nervous that I couldn't even really ask the questions easily. I sort of said, oh, can I, I rang the number and I pressed the thing to record and I'm looking at it just to make sure it's recording <laughs> in advance. There's those little Casio things that we yes, used to Yes, I still have one. <laughs> and basically she said, um, she answered the phone and I said, I didn't know it was her. I said, oh, can I speak to Dr. Maya Angelou? Not forgetting the doctor, you know, you have to say it. And she said, Maya speaking. I said, <laughs> because I didn't expect her to answer the phone. I thought it would be one of her people. And she said, no, I answer my own calls. I'm sitting here waiting for you, a cup of tea. Because obviously you've probably known I'm English. And she just carried on this conversation and we just laughed and talked. And I didn't want it to end. I really didn't want it to end. I remember having to turn over the, the little disc. And then I got an interview with her a second time and they flew us to a place, I assume it's her home. And I remember either she was doing yoga or stretching. She was on the floor on this beautiful Indian rug, right? And I sat on the floor, I took, obviously we took her shoes off and, and I sat on the floor with her and interviewed her with my task cam now, a big difference from the Casio. And I, we just spoke for hours. I think they gave us all... 15 or 20 minutes and mine went on and she said honey child you are powerful I remember her saying that to me you need to do something with this power that you have and I remembered that so I can actually say I felt like I was sitting on my grandmother's chair going back to that six-year-old or five-year-old that was that, that that's what that reminded me Nelson Mandela because I was holding his face, trying to put on some powder for him. I was doing makeup at the time because I took four years out and did makeup artistry. And he looked at me with that wink, you know, he had this sort of wink of an eye. And he sort of said, do you think I need it? Because the assistants were saying that he shouldn't put on the powder. And I said, well, it's going to take some shine off your face. So I said, but you don't really need it. Let's pretend. And we did. We pretended and we did the camera. And then late, years and years later, I was then sent down to South Africa to interview him. Little did I know that that, that's, that would happen. When we saw each other and he saw me coming in to interview, he said, I know, I know you. Do you see what I mean? So you don't know where your journey is going to end. You just got to do the best as you're doing it. Not be greedy and obnoxious and like some journalists that I'm seeing now, but, you know, just be an upright citizen and ask the questions you need to. The rest of it is research. Most of, most of it is research. You just ask the questions that you need to. And one of my questions to him was, I don't even know how you could sit here talking to us after all what you've gone through. And he said, it's because... I can I can sit here because of what I've gone through. Otherwise, you wouldn't even be talking to me. And that made a point because would we, we would have just been another leader and nobody would be maybe giving him as much attention mm-hmm. as he's getting now. So, in fact, he was allowed to, the word, the message that he wanted to pass over was being more, infiltrating society more than it would have been if he was just another minister or president. What do you want to leave with the world? Or oh, actually, one of my questions as we come to the end. No. Um, <laughs> how do you want to change or challenge the world doing what you do? 
I want to be able, for somebody said, when somebody repeats what I say, mm. and one of the things I say is, as we rise, as we go up in the elevator, because we've moved on from steps now, right? As we go up the elevator, remember to press that button and send it back down so that somebody can come along and join you in your quest for greatness. That's good. I'm goosebumps. Yes. Giving it back. Giving it back. Yeah. But we're doing it in the elevator. Mm. So indirectly, as we move up, sometimes just stop and hold somebody's hand. Sometimes you might take somebody up with you that doesn't deserve that, Mm -hmm. but you can't. How do we make that decision? You just say, at this moment, as I climb up. For example, I went to the uh, House of Lords the other day, just for a meeting. And somebody was, um, it asked me, how many tickets do you want? I just requested three. I don't know why. I just thought I'll take somebody with me. And really, it wasn't for them to listen to me speak, but more so for them to see the House of Lords. All these people are speakers and they're all influencers in their own way, but they've never been in that space. And I want them to see that if I could do it, I've now spoken in all these places, if I can do it, so can you. So, so that they can put that on their vision board. They can look on and say, you know what? Cherry took me to that House of Lords and I saw what it's like and I want to speak there. Just wow. give them a chance um, to to have a better vision board or to put it on the vision board, I would say. Yeah, and to make it happen. I was speaking to a very close friend today and she mentioned something. It's actually something I'm going to be talking about soon as well to my tribe about the whole thing about motivation and how come it's always outside of us and we don't see it's within us and what actually drives motivation. Mm -hmm. And it's linked so strongly to anger and fear because the only thing that drives motivation is action. And so whatever you've put on the vision board, you can stare at it for as long as you like, unless you're putting it into action through anger or fear and pushing past the barrier, then it becomes real. Then it's actually yes. like, oh God, I actually made that happen. <laughs> you made it happen. And look how indirectly we are making this happen. Because mm-hmm. by speaking to me and me speaking to you, somebody somewhere might be motivated to do that, to give up learning history and go out and just travel the Amazon, uh, go up into... When I went to Guyana this year, I had no idea that I was going to be going up into the hinterland where the indigenous people are and speaking to them and motivating the young people there. So even I said I was just going for six months rest. People go, six months, you'll be bored. You can't stay in a Caribbean for six months. You'll be bored. But I created, again, the environment that I wanted to share. Mm -hmm. And so that intuition to go was maybe it wasn't about me. Maybe that it was already designed for me and I was just going to deliver. And I did. And that was, that's one of the biggest tick boxes that I feel of that journey when I went on a little plane with just for eight or 10 people. And then on these big trucks that, you know, gave me bottom ache for days. <laughs> but, that, but, but just speaking to those 30 or 40 young Arawak children and for them to be, um, and for the Minister of Indigenous Affairs to send me a letter saying, thank you for what you've done. You've done it from your heart. And for him to put himself out to come and sit in the front row to hear me speak when I was speaking there, that showed that he appreciated all that I, I did. So I think in closing for you, I would like to say, go with the flow. Do what you want to do. Obviously, you've got to pay your bills. People have got to pay their bills, so you've got to do some jobs that maybe you don't like. But, you know, then do the other thing that you like as a psychic. Go and do it in the evening. You know, I did makeup in the evening. I did and makeup. Look, look at the journey through uh, PR and then doing beauty and then in the end coming right back around all of it is, a spo- is about how you treat people, isn't it? Makeup is making somebody feel good. The PR is, is, is get, making people feel buying the best. And then that's the sort of thing that happens. And now it's just the spoken word. And being a magazine editor is words and print. And now I'm doing the spoken word. It's all about me and how I feel and how I share. I love it. I love it. 
In closing, I'd love to hear from you on three of my values, what they mean to you. So you fill in the blank. So creativity for you is? Oh, this is a hard one. <laughs> creativity for me is words. Yeah, words, true. because I see a word and I see different words. You know, I see different meanings with words. And if I could, books are words for me. And I have so many books that I don't want to give away because they're all my friends. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Passion for you is? Giving of myself and the feeling that I get when I'm leaving. I am empowered by other people. And when I feel the vibe and, 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 and I can be passionate about something, I give 125, even 150%. Wow. Wisdom for you is? keeping on learning, learning and learning and learning. There's no such thing as can't. Mm. <laughs> so find a way, find a way. That's my thing. I turn every I can't into I and, and I can. There's no such thing as I can't. So you find a way. If I can't read a book because I'm always moving, I'm always busy, I buy the spoken word ones and then you can just download it and play it. And then maybe I'll go, I, the other day I did that with Gone Girl that's now out as a film, I think. But I was just so busy and I so wanted to read this book and I bought it. Somebody found it for me <laughs> and, um, and, I, and I spent the whole time while I was ironing or doing something. I don't even know who irons anymore, but I do sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. sherry Ann, thank you so much for being with us and sharing your empowering essence with us. And just the ease with which you've moved from phase to phase and experiencing your own epiphanies and sharing it with us today. Thank you for honoring yourself and your purpose and your vision and being the change that you want to see in the world. And for our listeners, you can find out more about Sherry Ann in the show notes where you can find her online, social media, her favorite book, her favorite quote favorite book if that's even possible (laughs) (laughs) but thank you so so much for being with us here today and for our listeners we will see and hear each other again next week and until then stay fast and furious and keep being the change that you want to see in the world i love you lots and sherry ann thank you so much bye-bye bye Dang, that was just super califragilistic expialidocious. I enjoyed having you on board and please do me and you a favor. Head on over to iTunes, SoundCloud or Stitcher. Click subscribe and a super bonus. Leave your review and you stand a chance of being announced and advertised on the show. I'm always striving to ensure that your brand is uplifted and empowered. Remember, done is better than perfect. So be sure to subscribe, leave a review, and send in your feedback too. You're the absolute best. Keep rocking.